In this video, I'm going to cover nuclear structure and stability. So what causes nuclei to decompose? Or better yet, what causes nuclei to stay together? Because remember that um, protons are positively charged and um, electrostatic repulsion says that two positively charged uh, particles should repel each other, should push away from each other. So what is it that causes a nucleus to be held together when a nucleus is composed only of positive particles and neutral particles? There's, there's lots of electric repulsion of the protons. So nuclei are inherently strained because this um, electric electrostatic repulsion is pushing the positive charges apart. Uh, but there's another force. There's, there's four fundamental forces in nature. There's gravity, um, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. So electromagnetism is uh, what c causes these particles to push apart, but there's another force, the strong nuclear force, that's causing these particles to be stuck together. So there's an exchange of particles between protons and neutrons, and that exchange of particles uh, creates an attractive force between those different particles. So this, this force, the strong nuclear force, is a very strong attractive force that's found only in the nucleus. Um, and it acts only over very short distances. So although the strong nuclear force is very strong to overcome the repulsion, the electromagnetic repulsion of the, uh, of the protons, um, it is only strong at very short distances. So the distances that we might find between protons uh, or neutrons within an atomic nucleus, but not, for example, between protons and electrons, that distance is far too great. So um, the neutrons play a, an important role in stabilizing the nucleus as neutrons add to the strong nuclear force. See, there's, there's strong nuclear force between neutrons and protons, but neutrons um, do not experience any electric repulsion because they're neutral. So neutrons do not add to the repulsive force but they do add to the attractive force because there's more neutrons uh, creating more strong nuclear force within a nucleus. So the strong nuclear force um, is created by uh, an exchange of particles between subatomic particles. And so when we think about subatomic particles like protons and neutrons and electrons, we generally think they're the smallest particles. But that's not true. The protons and neutrons are made of even smaller particles called quarks. And quarks can be up or down. So up quarks have a plus two-thirds charge. This is another thing that's uh, counterintuitive from what we know, what we've showed so far. Charges on particles um, on subatomic particles are always integer uh, values. So zero or plus one or plus two or minus one or minus two, but never minus one half or minus two and two thirds. Um, they're always whole numbers. But the charges on quarks are fractional charges. So up quarks have a plus two thirds charge and down quarks have a minus one third charge. So a proton is composed of two up quarks and a down quark which leads to an overall charge of plus one when we figure out how these cancel each other out and a neutron is composed of two down quarks and one up quark so minus two-thirds charge and plus two-thirds charge gives us a total charge of zero so protons and neutrons are composed of the same building blocks quarks but a proton has two ups and a down and a neutron has two downs and an up um, and so the strong nuclear force is uh, responsible for holding together a neutron and a proton. These up and down quarks are held together by the strong nuclear force. So the force that holds protons together, that holds these pieces together, is the strong nuclear force. And the force that also holds subatomic particles together, um, a proton to a neutron, is also the strong nuclear force. So the strong force holds together quarks to create protons and neutrons. It holds together these pieces and the strong nuclear force also holds together these pieces so to create larger structures, atomic nuclei. Um, these, this animation down here is uh, difficult to understand what's happening. But what's happening is that we see the up, up, down here. So this is a proton. 
so here we have um, a proton and down here we have a neutron and you can see that within the particles within the quarks inside of a proton they're trading these uh, these colored balls the colored balls are called gluons and gluons as they trade these gluons back and forth the quarks are changing flavors and so the flavors can be um, green or red or blue and green red or blue are kind of like plus and minus there's two flavors of electromagnetism they can be plus or minus well there's three flavors for quarks they can be green red or blue so as they change as they exchange gluons between each other their flavors are changing to blue to green green to blue um, and so this exchange of gluons is the is how the strong nuclear force holds together these particles inside of a proton and now you can see that um, as they're changing gluons they are then creating what are called mesons and meson is this one here with the the line over it the d with a line over it and it's the same force it's the strong nuclear force and the exchange of gluons these colored balls holds protons and neutrons together and the exchange of mesons this d with a line over it the exchange of mesons holds a proton to a neutron now having said all of this i don't expect any of you i'm not going to have any questions on the on the homework or on the exam that, that are based on the strong nuclear force or mesons or gluons or any of the flavors or anything that you're seeing here this is just further information to show you how to pro how are nuclei held together and what's causing nuclear decay why do, why do nuclei eventually decay so this is what holds um, forces together. If you want to learn more about this, you should take a particle physics class. And the weak nuclear force is the force that's responsible for turning uh, a proton into a neutron and a neutron into a proton. So remember, these are the kinds of um, things that happen during beta decay. So we can have beta emission, which is when a uh, proton turns into a neutron and proton turning into a neutron involves the release of a beta particle but we can also have a neutron turning into a proton and this involves the release of oh I said that backwards a neutron turning into a proton releases an electron and a proton turning into a neutron releases a positron so um, this the weak nuclear force is responsible for this transformation and the way that it works is um, we saw the strong nuclear force the up quarks and down quarks don't change their uh, their designation they're still up and down they're just changing their flavor they're going from red to green green to blue and so on and so on but up is always up and down is always down the weak nuclear force involves turning a down quark into an up quark or an up quark into a down quark and that releases uh, particles they're called bosons and these particles that are released um, have either uh, a negative charge like an electron or a positive charge like a positron uh, and this happens neutrons turn to positive to protons or protons turn to neutrons because that stabilizes the nucleus so um, the strong nuclear force holds the nucleus together the weak nuclear force turns protons into neutrons and vice versa in order to make nuclei more stable so how can we tell if a nucleus is stable well the ratio of neutrons to protons is an important measure of the stability of the nucleus if the neutron to proton ratio is too high neutrons are converted to protons so n to z is neutrons to protons if this number is too big that means i have too many neutrons if i have too many neutrons the neutrons are converted to protons via beta decay if the n to z ratio is too low that means I have too many protons and if I have too many protons then protons are converted to neutrons via positron emission or electron capture um, and we also see that this sometimes happens via alpha decay though it's not as effective as um, positron emission and electron capture 
So what do we mean n to z ratio? So n is neutrons and z is protons. This ratio of neutrons over protons gives us a number. And so remember, whenever we're looking at a nuclide or we're looking at uh, an isotope of an atom, we see a symbol like this, where it tells us that we have a mass number of 12 and an atomic number of 6. That means that their total mass is 12, so I have 12 particles in the nucleus, and six of them are protons. That means the other six are neutrons. So I can put the n to z ratio here, six protons, or excuse me, six neutrons over six protons. The n to z ratio in carbon 12 is one. For zirconium 90, I have 90 total particles in the nucleus, and 40 of them are protons. That means 50 of them are neutrons. So then I have 50 over 40, and that gives me an n to z ratio of 1.25 for zirconium 90. And for mercury 200, I have 200 total particles, 80 of which are protons. So that gives me 120 neutrons over 80 protons, which gives me a n to z ratio of 1.5. So the n to z ratio tells me whether the nucleus I'm looking at is stable. And the stability is just based on how many protons there are and how many neutrons and what that ratio is. So here is n to z equals one. You can see that's just a straight line here. When nuclei are small, the, uh, um, the, what makes a nucleus stable when it's small is an n to z ratio that's close to one. You can see that these green ones right here are stable and all of the yellow ones that uh, are, lie outside, those are all unstable nuclei. So we want a little bit more than one here, right? Uh, according to this, it's actually pretty close to one. But then as nuclei get bigger and bigger and bigger here, atomic number uh, 30, atomic number 40, atomic number 70, as they uh, nuclei get bigger and bigger and bigger, this um, n to z ratio that's stable starts to shift a little bit. It's, it gets further and further away from 1. Down here it's close to 1. Up here it's far away from 1. This is 1.5 uh, to make a stable nucleus. So we call this the valley of stability. And you can see right down here, this is a better representation. All of these dark ones are stable nuclei. Um, and any of the... Uh, what do we, here we go stable nuclei. Things that are red are radioactive, but they have a very, very long half-life, 10 to the 14 years. Things that are orange are radioactive with a shorter half-life, about 10,000 years. Yellow has a half-life of 100 years. Green has a half-life of one year. And things that are blue have a half-life of a second. Things that are light blue have a half-life of uh, a nanosecond. So you can see here that the ones that are dark are stable. They have no half-life because they never emit radiation. And we can see that the stable ones start to kind of move up a little bit. And then the stable ones end right here. After this, there are no more stable nuclei, but there are lots of unstable nuclei that are radioactive. And surrounding the line of stable nuclei are unstable nuclei on each side of the line going all the way up. What that tells us is that the only thing that's different between this blue one here and this dark one here is how many neutrons to how many protons. How many neutrons there are and how many protons there are. This tells us that the number of protons to neutrons in a nucleus is very important in order to create a stable nucleus. And there are lots of versions here. Uh, oops. If I look at this, this is... Um, it's too big. This is protons. Uh, this is atomic number 40 down here. So if I go on this line right here, atomic number 40, and go up, all of the atoms that have an atomic number of 40 are the same element. So here is one version of 40, and I had to look up 40. 40 is zirconium. So uh, here is element zirconium. Here's one type of zirconium, um, and it's zirconium because it has 40 protons. And let's see, this uh, looks like uh, 38 neutrons. So 40 protons, 38 neutrons. 40 protons, 39 neutrons. 40 protons, 40 neutrons. 40 protons, 41 neutrons. 40 protons, 42 neutrons, and so on. So we can create an atom if I have 40 neutrons and 38 
excuse me, 40 protons and 38 neutrons right here, this atom right here, um, this is stable at least for, you know, 10 to the negative 8, 10 to the negative 7 seconds. And then I can keep adding neutrons to zirconium. Here is the, another version of zirconium. Here's another isotope of zirconium. Here's another isotope of zirconium. Another, 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 and so on and so on and so on until finally here is a stable isotope of zirconium. Here's another stable isotope of zirconium. Here's another stable isotope of zirconium. Here's another stable isotope. So there's four stable isotopes of zirconium here, but there's about 20 unstable isotopes of zirconium that are radioactive because the ratio of neutrons to protons is incorrect. So we can uh, see that the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus is very precise in order to create a stable particle and in fact most of the particles that we have created or that we have found naturally that it either exist naturally or we have made um, in a reactor are unstable look at all of these unstable all of the blue ones and all of the green ones everything that's not black is unstable so that's lots of radioactive nuclei very few that are not radioactive So, um, if we, this, line, this axis here is neutrons, this axis here is protons. So this blue line is the valley of stability, and this black line is n over z equals 1, or n equals z, right? They have the same number of protons and neutrons. So remember, n over z equals 1 does make nuclei stable up until we get to about, what's this, uh, element 16. And then we start to need more neutrons, and then more and more neutrons, and more and more neutrons. So as elements get bigger and bigger and bigger, we need more neutrons. So if this blue line represents the valley of stability, and all the nuclei on this blue line are stable, then anything on this side is unstable, all the brown dots are red. And all of the dots on this side are also unstable, all the green dots. But how do we know, depending on where a nucleus lies, on, on the brown side or on the green side, how do we know what kind of radioactive decay it's going to undergo? So we can determine that if uh, blue is stable and this axis is neutrons, then anything that's to the left of the blue line has too many neutrons. And anything that's to the right of the blue line has too many protons. And anything that's on the blue line has exactly the right number of neutrons and protons. So, if something is a green dot, it exists up here above the valley of stability, has too many neutrons, then how does it stabilize itself? If it has too many neutrons, it has to get rid of a neutron. How does it get rid of a neutron? It does that by uh, converting a neutron into a proton. So if a neutron is being converted into a proton, then it's going to emit a beta particle, beta minus emitter. And on the other side, uh, if something is one of these red dots, that means it's unstable. And it's unstable because it has too many protons. And if it has too many protons, it's going to convert a proton into a neutron. And in order to convert a proton into a neutron, that nucleus undergoes positron emission, or we also call that beta plus. Remember, it's the positron is a positively charged electron, so beta minus is an electron with a negative charge. Beta plus is an electron with a positive charge, or also called a positron. So depending on where a nucleus lies relative to the value of stability, we can determine whether it's going to be a beta minus emitter or a beta plus emitter. Is it going to turn uh, neutrons into protons, or is it going to turn protons into neutrons to become more stable? So there are what we call magic numbers when we're looking at uh, radioactive nuclei. So besides the ratio of uh, neutrons to protons, which is very important, the actual numbers of protons and neutrons affect stability. So we've um, thought about this idea of magic numbers before when we think about electrons. So uh, all right, so here's our periodic table. So we've thought about magic numbers in terms of electrons before. What's the first magic number of electrons? One, two. Two is a magic number for electrons because that's a full shell. What's the next magic number of electrons? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 
or 10 total electrons, 2 in the first shell, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in the next shell. What's the next magic number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 more than that. So these here are kind of magic numbers of electrons and we call them magic numbers because they're particularly stable. There's room in orbitals for a certain number of electrons and when those orbitals are full those um, orbitals are particularly stable more so than orbitals that are not full. So there's a certain number of magic numbers with regard to how many electrons go into an orbital. But we can also say that there's magic numbers with regard to the specific numbers of protons and neutrons. So just like there are four orbitals that each take two electrons, so there's eight total electrons that can fit in a shell, there are also proton shells and neutron shells. And so not just the total number of protons and neutrons, they don't cram in there any old way randomly. The protons and neutrons are very specifically organized inside the nucleus into shells. And so when we have a full shell of protons, or a full shell of neutrons, that's particularly stable, just like having a full shell of electrons. So, um, most stable nuclei have even numbers of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are more stable when they come in pairs, just like electrons. Only a few have odd numbers of protons and neutrons. Um, if the total number of nucleons adds to a magic number, the nucleus is more stable. So, uh, if n or z equals 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, or n, the number of neutrons equals 126, these are particularly stable magic numbers. These make shells inside the nucleus, and these are complete shells. 2 and 8, those are just like electrons. The first electron shell is 2. The second electron shell is 8. The first atomic nucleus shell is 2 and the, the second nuclear shell is 8 and then uh, they change a bit 20, 28 and so on. This has to do with the shape of the nucleus and how those protons and neutrons pack in there. So we can see down here um, when neutrons and protons are both even there are 157 stable nucleides that have even and even. When protons are even and neutrons are odd, there's 53 stable. When protons are odd and neutrons are even, there's 50 stable. And the number of stable nucleides that have an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons is only five. And that shows us that having even and even is particularly stable, and having odd and odd is particularly destabilizing. So in nature, often one radioactive nuclide changes into another radioactive nuclide. So when um, we find radioactive minerals in nature, radioactive uranium, for example, uranium doesn't decay once and then become something that's stable. Uranium decays into something that's unstable, which decays into something that's unstable, which decays into something that's unstable, and so on and so on and so on, until finally the decay product of one of those uh, in, the, in the end of the decay series will be a stable nucleus. So um, all atoms that have more than 83 protons are radioactive. So the last stable uh, element on the periodic table is bismuth with uh, 83 protons. And remember you can tell the difference between stable um, elements and those that have no stable isotopes because the mass number is in uh, parentheses for elements that have no stable isotopes. So all of these that have, parent, uh, that have a decimal point and more uh, precise numbers uh, are those that are stable and we can actually weigh them and those in parentheses are um, the mass number of the most stable isotope of that um, element but all of all of those that are in uh, parentheses so from polonium forward they're all radioactive so element 84 is radioactive all the way up to element 118 they're all radioactive from that point forward uh, all of the radioactive nuclides that are produced one after the other until a stable nucleide is made is called a decay series so for example here's the decay series for uranium 238 uranium 238 uh, has 92 protons and when it decays by alpha decay it becomes the element that has two fewer so it'll have 90 protons 
but look, we don't, um, here's uranium with 92. We don't get to an element that is stable until we get to 83. So from uranium down to bismuth, uranium has to lose, each uranium atom is going to have to lose nine protons before it becomes something that has the right number of protons. And even then, it's going to have to lose some number of neutrons also because it has to have the right n to z ratio. So for uranium 238 to become uh, to become non-radioactive, uh, to become stable, requires several decays. So it has an alpha decay, and then a beta decay, and a beta decay, and then alpha, 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 and then it could do either beta or alpha. Um, and here we can have a beta or an alpha decay again, and so on and so on and so on. And even here, here's bismuth. We've gotten to bismuth, which is um, an element that's potentially stable because it has uh, a stable number of protons. But in bismuth 210, it does not have the right n to z ratio, so bismuth 210 is still radioactive. And we get down to uh, polonium. 210, which is radioactive, and thallium, 206, which is radioactive. Finally, the end of this decay series is lead, 206. So look, there's several different, uranium is very radioactive, not because the uranium itself is so radioactive, but because uranium becomes this, which is radioactive, which becomes this, which is radioactive, which becomes this, which is radioactive, and so on and so on. So if you had a pure sample of uranium-238, depending on the half-life of each of these decays, over time, you would have a sample that had potentially as many as all of these different nuclei in it at the same time that were all emitting radiation, that were all emitting their own alpha and beta particles. So here's some examples of the half-lives of various nucleides. So uh, thorium-232 uh, undergoes alpha decay, and it has a very long half-life. That's about uh, 10 billion years. Um, uranium-238 is about uh, 4 billion years. Um, also alpha an alpha emitter. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years. Radium, or excuse me, radon-220 has a half-life of 56 seconds. And thorium-219 has a half-life of about 1 microsecond. So thorium-219 emits uh, particles very quickly, and thorium-232 emits particles very slowly. Here's a, a, a longer table. Um, we can see that um, the half-life of different nucleides varies uh, depending on the stability of the nucleus. And so some uh, nuclei, nucleides are very radioactive and have a very short half-life, and some are very are relatively stable and have a very long half-life. So here are the half-lives of the nucleides in the uranium-238 series. So uranium has a half-life of about uh, four and a half billion years. So Uranium-238, that means that it's going to be around for a long time. Th it's going to turn into thorium, and thorium has a half-life of 24.1 days. So that means that when I look at all of the half-lives of these, all of these nucleides that are created, the ones that are there for a while, if I pick up a sample of uranium-238 that's been decaying for a while, it's likely to have uranium-238 in it, it's likely to have uranium-234, and thorium and radium. Um, it probably has some lead, 210, uh, and that's probably it, right? These that, that have years. So if the half-life is years, then there's probably a detectable amount of those um, isotopes in a sample of your what was once your pure uranium-238. So um, eventually, as the decay series goes on, there are more and more isotopes um, emitting different kinds of radiation. Okay, so here again, re remember if you're if you don't quite remember what half lives are and you don't quite remember doing this in the kinetics chapter, go back and check out those videos. But here's just a, a quick uh, review of what a half life is. Half life means that um, it's the amount of time that's required for half of the sample to decay. 
So when I have a million, if I go from one million to half a million, that's half, right? How long did that take? One minute. So then when I go from half a million, what's half, what's half of half a million? To uh, 250,000. Half of 250,000 is 125,000. And then uh, 67, five or, or so on and so on. So um, the amount of time required, and, it's, and this is something to consider too. The, after the first half-life, I lose half a million uh, particles. After the second half-life, I don't lose another half million. In that case, if I lost half of the original sample every time, there would only ever be two half-lives for any process ever. After the first half-life, I lose the first half, and after the second half-life, I lose the second half, and there's only ever two halves. So the half-life does not mean that it's half of the original amount every time. It's half of the remaining amount every time. So the first time I have a, hundred, a million remaining, half of that is half a million. So when I have half a million remaining, half of that, and then half of that, and then half of that, and half of that, and half of that, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you can see that most of the radioactive atoms decay in the first half-life. Half of them, literally 50%, are gone. The next half-life gets rid of another 25%, and then another 12.5%, and then another 6.75%, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so the, the stragglers hang on for a while. The stragglers hang on for 9 or 10 half-lives, but the, at least half of the radioactive particles are gone after the first half-life. Uh, radioactive decay is always a first-order process. So what that means is that uh, we look at first order kinetics and that says that the ratio of the radioactive particles at time t divided by how many I started with, the natural log of that ratio is equal to negative kt, the rate constant times the time, how much time it takes. So um, we can use this idea that the that the half-life is constant and that the uh, number of particles at any given time is uh, we can calculate the number of particles left if we know the half-life and what we started with given uh, the the way that the kinetics equations work we can use this to date certain materials for example if we go back to this um, decay series if I look at how much lead 210 there is in a sample versus how much radium there is in a sample, versus how much thorium, versus uranium-234 and 238. If I look at the ratio of all of these different compounds, then I can determine how old this sample of uranium-238 is. How much of this is left? How much of this is left? How much of this is left? If I know all their half-lives and I know how much I started with, then I can use that information to figure out how old the sample is. So we call this radiometric dating. So I can measure and compare the amount of a parent radioactive isotope and its stable daughter, and we can determine how old something is. Um, so uh, we can compare the amount of uranium-238 to lead-206 in volcanic rocks and meteorites. This is the radioactive parent, and this is the stable daughter. And so if I look at the ratio, how much of this is left and how much of this is there, that tells me how long has this been turning into this. And I can get a, 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 an age of that material. Um, using this process, we can date the Earth to between 4 and 4.5 four and billion years old. So we can look at naturally occurring uranium-238 and measure how much of it there is to lead-206. Remember, the half-life of uranium-238 is about 4.5 billion years. So if uranium-238 was formed at the beginning of the Earth, when the Earth was formed, and we measure how much of this has been created, then I know how long it's been. I know how long that U-238 has been emitting uh, radiation. We can always also use um, radioactive carbon to do this. So um, all organic material, organic material being coming from something that was once alive, uses carbon. So all organic uh, molecules have carbon in them. So the most stable form of carbon is carbon-12. And so your body is made of mostly carbon atoms, and most of those carbon atoms are carbon-12. Some of the carbon atoms in your body are carbon-14. 
uh, because carbon-14 is a naturally occurring isotope of carbon and it's radioactive. So when you eat food, you're eating food uh, that's made of carbon and some of those carbon atoms that you eat are carbon-14. Plants are breathing uh, CO2 from the air. Some of the CO2, some of the carbon atoms in the CO2 that the plants breathe are carbon-14 atoms. So they incorporate carbon-14 into the fruit and you eat the fruit and so you get carbon-14 in you. And so we're always getting more carbon-14 in us when we're alive. We're always consuming carbon-14. But when we die, we stop consuming carbon-14. So if we look at a sample of dead material and we figure out how much carbon-14 is left, then we know when, that's, when that thing died. We know how old it is because we, we know that a, uh, something that is dead is no longer taking in new carbon-14. Therefore, we can look at how much is left and figure out how long ago it stopped taking in new carbon-14. So while still living, carbon-14, carbon-12 ratio is constant because the organism is constantly replenishing its supply of carbon. CO2 is in the air, which is the ultimate source of carbon for all organisms. Once the organism dies, C14 starts to decay and it turns into carbon-12, so the C14, C12 ratio decreases. By measuring this ratio and knowing the half-life of carbon-14, we can determine how long ago the organism was alive. So um, since the half-life is about 5,500 years, we can detect carbon-14 for about nine half-lives. After nine half-lives, there's not enough carbon-14 left for us to detect anymore, and that's about 50,000 years old. So we can use this to date things that are about 50,000 years old or younger. Um, so there is a small amount of natural radioactivity uh, in uh, radioact 